Welcome, everybody. It's the 30th of August, 2020, and we're in the middle of uh, a pandemic uh, globally. And uh, we're also in the middle of um, a very interesting time because I feel the pandemic has opened us up to unfinished parts of our lives and our societies. And um, so not only are we dealing with uh, a, a health crisis globally, and we really have friends and family members um, who have succumbed to um, the disease. Um, and, and if that weren't bad enough, we are also facing an incredible amount of social and cultural tension, racial tension. And this began with um, the racial riots in the US on the 5th or 4th and 5th of June, if I'm not mistaken. So right around then, uh, we had this deep urge, this deep need that it's time to do something around truth and reconciliation. And uh, to do this work in such a way that it is done from the inside out. So I'm Neelima Bhatt, and uh, I'm joined here by my husband, Vijay Bhatt. We're from Mumbai. And um, this Truth and Reconciliation weekend was launched on the 4th and 5th of July. 4th of July was American Independence Day. 5th of July was Guru Purnima, which is a very important day for higher consciousness that's celebrated here uh, in yoga in India. And the whole uh, effort has been to say, how do, we, um, how do we start healing the trauma, the schisms, the wounds uh, that keep our psyche split from each other? And then how do we start leading the good possible future that we know awaits all of us? So the Truth and Reconciliation work is a decentralized global movement. You're all invited to be part of it. When we launched it over that weekend, we just put an invitation out to all the people we know who are doing this kind of work. And uh, Kristen Engwig of the WIN Conference, she joined us. Uh, Kiran Reddy of the Helm of Aid, a wonderful millennial organization, they joined us. And this became a self-organizing uh, weekend and we had 66 speakers, uh, we had 47 events, we had uh, 1,800 people from all over the world who participated. It was all done with the economy, pay by heart, pay it forward. And everyone was sharing their um, skill set in uh, healing and um, leading um, truth and reconciliation from the inside out. And there were people who felt called to show up for these wonderful online uh, Zoom gatherings. And so some, some really good and real transformational work took place. And it is our belief that every time people like this gather, like we are gathering today, and we do very genuine work to start um, healing our schisms, uh, we will heal not just ourselves, but we will also heal the collective that we are a part of. So towards that end is um, the August um, uh, event that we are offering in this Truth and Reconciliation Movement. I said to Vijay, uh, since both of us have done work around uh, leadership and around healing, uh, let's offer this, this perspective around identity. Uh, and it's called the Inclusive I. And we're offering it in service of the Truth and Reconciliation movement. Our company is Roots and Wings, and I think you'll get to see uh, a little bit yeah. about how that too <laughs> very much ties in with the work we're doing today. Vijay, any, any quick uh, thoughts from you before we dive in? No, uh, I think carry on. I'll jump in as required. Okay. So what are we doing today? The Inclusive Eye is about how to hold our identity lightly okay? in a fragmented and polarized world where othering has become the norm. How do we hold each other? 
without losing ourselves. How do we get past the conventional and limiting notions of identity and get into a more holistic and inclusive space? And in classic Roots and Wings style, our format have information. We will give you some insights that you may not otherwise have had perhaps. And then there will be discovery for yourself to be the topic of the day. And then there will be recovery. There will be some tools and techniques that help you get to the inclusive eye. Anything else, Vijay, at this point? No, just to uh, invite people and say that uh, as you hear the conversation unfold, if you have any questions or comments, then please put them in the chat box rather than calling them out so that we can keep track so of them ensure that we will answer the questions even if it goes beyond the scheduled time we will be here to answer the questions you'd like to stay on so please use the chat box for your questions and comments thank you thanks Vijay so uh, I hope you all got the uh, reconfirmation email. I had asked that uh, bring a couple of sheets of paper and a pen for each one of you, because we are going to dive right in into one uh, personal identity review. So go grab a pen and piece of paper and let me just explain what we're gonna do here. If you notice there's hand for a reason on the screen. In this personal identity review, I'm going to call out some descriptors, okay? And most of them are binary, and you're going to have to choose the one that you identify with. There is no right or wrong answer. There'll also be an opportunity to choose something you identify with that is not binary. binary. Uh, don't overthink it, choose quickly, and be true to yourself. You will get to add to the list if something important to you has not been covered. So we want you once to write we're going to make a whole... We want you to yeah. write it down. Start writing down. Want to... Once you have finished capturing the whole list that you have chosen, then I will take you to the second part of the exercise when we get into placement and ranking of those descriptors that identify yourself with, okay? So let's not get lost in uh, too much thinking. Let me just explain how it goes. I'm going to call it out and you just have to start writing. So what do you identify with, man or woman? What is your identity? Next, are you Eastern or Western? Now this is a forced choice binary for a reason. So put this, be with us, just play with this. Are you Eastern or Western? Do you consider yourself from the North or from the South? Are you cultured or are you natural? Are you modern or traditional? Do you go for the arts or for the science? Are you creative or logical? Are you mental or emotional? Are you thoughtful or spontaneous? Are you a singer or a dancer? Are you a player or a spectator? Father or mother? Believer or a non-believer? A rightist or a leftist? A giver or a taker? You drive the slow lane or the fast lane? 
Are you feminine or masculine? Are you old or young? Are you thin or fat? Are you fit or unfit? Are you fair or dark? Short or tall? Local or foreigner? Rich or poor? Educated or uneducated? Well traveled or untraveled? Do you come from a big town or a small town? Are you salaried or are you an entrepreneur? Are you a brother or a sister? A son or a daughter? A husband or a wife? A parent or a child? Nationally, do you identify with the colonizer or the colonized? Are you a capitalist or a socialist? An optimist or a pessimist? An introvert or extrovert? Aggressive or submissive? Focused or easygoing? Dreamer or practical? Ideologue or laissez-faire? Are you white or are you colored? Sophisticated or innocent? Spiritual or material, religious or secular. And now you get to choose kind of binaries, but choose one thing, okay? So when I ask you, what is your religion? Write one answer. What is your nationality? One answer. is your caste? What is your class? Lower, middle, upper. What is your sexual orientation? Apparently there are 15. Or your gender identity? Apparently there are several. What is your race? What is your profession? Here's an interesting one. What is your generation? General, generation X, Y, Z, millennial, senior, baby boomer. Some people have asked you to go a bit slow. So just give people a little bit of time, please, Nilima. In the chat, somebody has said, okay. please go a little bit slow. Okay. It doesn't matter really because if there's something important, you will now bring it up. So we're going to move into the second half of the exercise. It doesn't matter if you missed something because it will now come up, I'm sure. I want you to take a blank sheet of paper and draw these three concentric circles as you see on the screen. And it is called, Who Am I?
So once you're done drawing three concentric circles like here, let's take this one slowly. I want you to list in the inner circle the top three descriptors you most identify with. You have a full list that you wrote and scribbled. Now look at that full list and choose the top three descriptors you most identify with. What, don't need to do it just now, I'm just explaining it to you. I'm going to give you about seven minutes to do this. The next, in the middle circle, you will list the next five descriptors that are important to you. And then in the last outer circle, you will list the next five descriptors that also impact your life or have shaped your sense of self, your identity. So let me give you just one, one example from my side. If this were my list, one of my top three would be a believer. Because I'm a real believer in the divine. So that is a very core of my identity. So one of my top three in the inner circle would be the, a believer. In the next, in the middle circle, one of my five would be the identity of mother. Being a mother is very important to me. And in the last five descriptors, one of them for me would have been being dark. Because as a kid, my family always pointed out that I was dark skinned. And it became a part of my sense of self. So go ahead and take about seven minutes to list your inner circle three, your middle circle five, and the outer circle five. Go ahead.
we have a good question from Rajesh Gangwani. Uh, you can feel free to add some descriptors that I had not called out. And uh, this is for Mitu. Mitu, you will have an opportunity to share in a short while when we do the breakouts. So you don't need to share it right now. I hope everyone's doing okay. You have another two minutes or so before we will move to the next part of the session. And so please focus on the top three in the center and the next five. Uh, even if you don't have the last five in the outermost circle, that's fine. So another two more minutes to go. And those of you who have finished, I invite you to just look at that circle and reflect back and just see what is it saying about your sense of identity? Does, to what extent does this capture who you are and who you think you are and who you show you are? while we wait for the others to complete. Jenti, that's absolutely fine, saying it's very difficult to choose. We are playing with this, okay? We are making it a forced choice, just so that you learn something about yourself. So play with it. You can choose differently now. No, no need to type in what you glean unless, uh, yeah, you want to give some ahas here, go ahead. In the end, we're also going to do some call out. So uh, if you feel like putting it in, great. But Vijay will getting you to also share later. Vijay, I think we can go with the next. All right. Okay, so I hope everyone's had a chance to make those choices. Look at your own list and then shortlist, and then actually put them into the central circle, the next circle, and the out circle. And I hope you're feeling good about what you see there. So what we want you now to do is, having done the selection, we would like you to now actually vocalize and share. And the way we are going to do this is we are going to put you into breakout room of three people each. Uh, so let me tell you how it's going to work. We're going to put you into groups of three at random. So you will get to know and work with people who you probably never met before, probably from different countries. And so I think this will be interesting for you and for the groups as well. So here are your instructions. So here are your What we would like you to do is that we would like you to, as I said, operate in threes. And when you go into the room, one of you will be the speaker for the first three minutes. 
then the next person will have a chance to speak and then the third person would have a chance to speak when the speaker is listening the other two will be listeners and i invite all of you to keep time just so that we can finish this exercise in 10 minutes and you can be back what do we want you to do we want you to obviously you know call out your name but the important thing that we'd like you to do is we'd like you to share your top 3 inner circle descriptors only the top 3 not the others and we want you to say a little bit about where and how did these come about for example if nilima had said that one of her descriptors was that of a guy then she would say you know as i went through life these things happened to me and this was a turning point from where on i realized that this belief was very strong for me so there'll be a event or a turning point or a aspect of your life where you suddenly realized oh this is a very important part of my identity the second question we want you to answer is how have these top 3 things served you so in what way have they benefited you and what way have they helped you and maybe in some cases what have they blocked out for example somebody might have put a descriptor in that circle which might have robbed them of opportunities and so if that has happened to you it's very important that you be able to share that this particular descriptor actually blocked me from something rather than benefited me in a certain way and the third is we want you to talk about under what circumstances and what kind of stressors what are those flash points where that identity can get suddenly triggered and you might get entrenched or you might get defensive or you might get loud so what happens when those identities are triggered so these are the three things we would like you to speak about in the in the breakout rooms important thing for the listeners please only listen no evaluation no judgment no questions no sharing that i felt this way and so on just purely listen give the speaker the space and please listen with head and heart and this is important after the speaker finishes we would like the listeners to acknowledge them by saying aloud and i'm just going to use rajesh as an example here if i was in the breakout room with rajesh i would say after he has spoken rajesh i see you and then the next listener would say rajesh i see you and then you move on to the next speaker you rotate your roles so 3 minutes 3 minutes 3 minutes and then 10 minutes in all so let me just check if you have any questions or if you haven't okay. understood can you please put your questions in the chat box otherwise i'm going to invite nilima to send you into your breakouts of 3 you will have 10 minutes from the time we start and uh, you will know on your screen that your 10 minutes are up and you'll be back in the plenary so if you have any questions of clarification please put them in the chat otherwise nilima you can go ahead and put people into the breakout rooms okay i'm ready to hit uh, open all rooms yeah go for it vandana is also in the teaching faculty right you mentioned teaching yes so am i so we go from time tables <laughs> one thing <period laughs> to another another thing yes well welcome back vijay do you want to debrief that yeah so you're going to put up your screen yeah okay so uh, i hope that was fun i know it was very short time 
but we just wanted to give you a taste of what it feels like to not only identify some of your key identity descriptors but also to be able to vocalize them and equally to be able to hear what are some of other people's identity descriptors you suddenly get an insight into how people see themselves and how people themselves. express themselves so we don't have too much time for detailed debriefs but what i'm going to do is to just ask one or two people to share what happened in your room literally just give us a one minute debrief of what happened and uh, what was interesting so why don't i ask uh, neeraj neeraj would you like to tell us what happened in your room and uh, what was interesting for you you can unmute yourself neeraj neeraj you there no i don't think he can hear us so you want to you're on mute you're on mute nilima should i ask iris to share iris Go. from israel go ahead iris unmute and share okay of course we didn't have enough time uh i was in the room with alok from india and with stephanie from france which was really amazing i think well in the big sense what we found out is that a lot of stuff are similar and as uh and and i didn't think so because it's three different people from three different places and really not connected but it felt when i said to alok alok i see you i really saw you so saw him i felt like he was here with me in the room and i see him and uh maybe i would share my own because i don't feel uh comfortable to share other people's uh i told them that my biggest surprise was was the second circle the second circle was for me mother wife daughter sister and israeli and i didn't even notice i that i was so so much connected to family that it is so important for me and it's not in the small one in the three but it's it's in the first five ones so it made me it made me think a lot of who i am and uh and 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 i wrote it like in, in one minute in one minute i was done with it so i i had no thoughts and and i don't think i'm binary but you know this is what is is it important for me so it was really uh interesting uh we had uh feminine in all all our uh, <laughs> all of us wrote feminine and women and and it was really interesting really uh thank you thank you iri uh, let me ask uh, rajesh rajesh would you like to share what happened in your group you can unmute yourself yeah i'll have to switch off my video because right now it's very unstable so oh. i can oh. no problem hello yeah go ahead rajesh yeah um so um we had nina jeremy and me in the group i think we lost him uh on uh, and and all three of them were so locked into where we all each came from you know uh -huh. whether, it was, whether it was the country in one case where it, where uh, in one case it was where uh, nina grew up in the surroundings that she grew up um uh, for jeremy it was about where i mean he called himself a spontaneous migrant and the fact that he traveled so much and and he was a jew in england for, and and on the road for 18 years traveling so and for me it was being family centric and because coming from a very large family from both sides mom and so being very very connected to the family so that was i think a very interesting part of where we drew our identity from 
and the words used were so fascinating for each. In one case, in her case, Nina's case was natural, creative, and spiritual. And, and it was beautiful. And what I saw was all three words were connected with each other. In all our cases, all the three words, there was almost like a thread connecting all the three words. For Jeremy also, it was human being, humanitarian, and spontaneous migrant. And I think he beautifully described all the three, how they gelled together. For me, it was family-centric introvert and, and a sense of calm. And I could see that there was some kind of invisible thread running through all the three. So yeah, beautiful. Uh, I wish we had more time to delve into each each uh, word. Yes, yes. And of course, you can, Rajesh, you can do that when you, you know, after this session is over, the idea here was to just open up a door for you to look at your identity in, in this way. There are many ways to look at identity that Nilima will talk about. But usually when we do this activity, what we find from groups is exactly what you described, which is that the other person's identity is as valid, as legitimate, and as strongly felt by them as your identity feels to you. Yeah. yeah. And when you realize this, there is a real aha moment because somehow we tend to hold our identity so close and we are so attached to it that we don't realize that everybody is doing the same with themselves. So yeah. this, is, this is a very big, a very big uh, insight that people have. Uh, so Nilima, can you change the slide, please? Next slide. So I don't know how many of you are aware of this uh, little story. It's, a, it's an Indian story about these four blindfolded men and the elephant. So for those of you who don't know it, let me tell it to you very, very quickly. So these four blindfolded uh, men are uh, touching different parts of the elephant. The guy who's touching the leg of the elephant says, oh, this is a pillar. The guy who's touching the trunk of the elephant says, oh, this is like a, like a, uh, this is like a, a horse pipe, something flexible. The person who's touching the tail of the elephant says, oh, this is a rope. And the guy who's lying on the elephant's back is saying, wow, this is a sofa. Now the question is, are they all right? Or are they all wrong? Or is it both? Right? And uh, it's a lovely little story because it tells us that actually there are blindfolds preventing us from seeing reality as it is. And one of the paradoxical things about identity is that identity is one of those blindfolds. And so if you are able to understand that on one hand, our identity shapes us, as you saw, but our identity can also be a blindfold that stops us from seeing reality as it is, and therefore having a shared view of reality. This story of the five blindfolded men or the four blindfolded men brings it to life beautifully. I'm going to hand over to Nilima because I know she wants to make a connection from this story and reconciliation. Go ahead, Nilima. Uh, thanks, Vijay. So going back to the idea of truth and reconciliation, if you think of the elephant as the truth and how each one of us seems to have a different part of the truth, a different piece of truth. And that's because we have our identity blindfold on. So if you're talking about reconciliation, we really have to be able to unpeel from our identity in order to see the full truth for what it is, and in order to reconcile all the different pieces that we are seeing or holding, and be able to put them together and to see the full picture, so to speak. So some observations about um, identity, you know, identity can be a proxy for our values, right? Like we are what we stand for and it becomes a very tightly held thing. And interestingly, our identity is partially chosen through choices we make, but it's also partially given. I mean, I, I can, I'm, I'm given the fact that I am a biological woman. I am given the fact that I was born in India. So there are some things that are given and some things I choose to claim as myself. Now, here's a very important thing, that identity is necessary and 
it is so strangely limiting. Now, why is it necessary? Because identity gives us a sense of self. And uh, think about it. Everything quantum physics tells us is essentially one soup. Um, spirituality tells us everything is one consciousness. And yet with that, we have to function as healthy individuals. And right down to biology, from the time we are born, our little baby immune system has to figure out what are my cells, what is self, and what is non-self, correct? And that is how uh, baby's immune system protects the baby's body from falling sick and being attacked by antigen. Similarly, from, you know, we see in our DNA very specific kinds of DNA that are unique to us. I know in America, it's a big thing. Everyone gets their DNA decoded and says, oh, I'm one Native American, I'm one half German, etc." cetera. So um, we, you know, we do need a sense of self and that identity is in a way biologically hardwired into us. Our immune system has created a sense of I and other, self and non-self. But it's also created a psychological sense of me and the other. And this is good for individuating. When I have to get a sense of what is my unique role to play in life, to play in society, to play in my family? What am I here to uniquely be? So in order to individuate as a unique aspect of this one soup, I need to have an identity. So it is necessary. And at the same time, it is limiting because it creates the other. It creates the non-self. And what that does is identity becomes a screen, a filter, a lens, and it distorts reality. Sorry. We have this very famous Ane Nin quote, right? We don't see things as they are. We see things as we are. So what does reality look like without your screen of your identity? Take a moment to think about that because we've seen the whole world through the lens of our identity. And this is how othering begins, right? So here's a cute cartoon of, sir, this is like our brain cells telling the, the headquarters. We are receiving information that collects with the core identity, the core belief system that you have about who you are. And then the headquarters says, get rid of it, get rid of it, right? Anything that doesn't uh, align with our sense of self, we push away. And that is how we start creating me and someone else. This is me, this is not me. And this is how othering begins. We start seeing people as not me. And then othering turns into conflict, right? You're looking at the same truth. One person says that's a six and the other person says that's a nine. Right there, othering becomes the cause for conflict. Now, as we're talking about recovering from the limitations of identity, here's a thought, you know, just because you are right does not mean I am wrong. You just haven't seen life from my side. So just play with this idea. And as I call out these slides, please let your belly relax, um, allow your heart to open, allow your mind to open. This is perhaps the most important slide as far as I'm concerned. There are many, many levels to identity. Our identity is like an onion. We are made up of many levels. So this core undifferentiated me, the first thing I get on as identity is a gender. Then based on the family I'm born into, my identity has a race and a religion. Based on the society I'm born into, my identity has a class and or a caste. Based on the nation I am born into, my identity says I come from a developed nation or a developing nation. And then, of course, I'm born as a human. So I also have a planetary identity. In this planet, I am a human. I play the species role. So that is also identity. I am a human in this planet vis-a-vis -vis an antelope or an ant, right? 
Now, here's the interesting thing that all of this work in binaries very often, okay? That is just human nature. And what we tend to do is some of these identities are privileged and some of these identities, the binary opposite becomes underprivileged, okay? So think about it. If you, if you are male, you are more privileged than a female. If you come from the white race, you are more privileged than if you come from a color race. If you um, come from a developing country, you are less privileged than someone who comes from a developed country and so on. So right here you can see that identity gets entangled with privilege and power. So each one of you can start seeing whether you are above the line in each of these dimensions and levels or you are below the line. Do, are you in, an, in a privileged position in that binary or are you in an underprivileged position, right? And just like they talk about IQ and EQ, I think there's something called um, PQ, right? Your privilege quotient. <laughs> so if you, in some of these boxes, you're above the line, some you're below the line, you put it all together, you're a very complex mix and you are probably net privileged in your identity or you are net underprivileged in your identity. And this becomes a huge cause for trouble between people, right? It becomes a power game. Can I so just jump in here for a second? Yeah, go ahead, Vijay. Go back, just go back, please. And I guess the only yeah. point I want to add here point is of... that all of this is happening unconsciously. That this layering that takes place layering. from me to the personal, to the family, to the society, to the nation, to the planetary and all levels in between, very little of it is happening consciously. Okay. Much of it is happening unconsciously. And so you can imagine what happens when an unconsciously privileged person encounters an unconsciously underprivileged person. The power dynamic is immediately distorted. This you might call unconscious bias. So I think the important point here is that the, the, this, this distinction above the line and below the line is not a cognitive choice. It is a subcognitive uh, uh, disposition. So sorry, please go ahead. And so you can speak to this, Vijay, that five clues that your identity is limited. Whether we like it or not, we have an identity. And now let's work with that. Yeah. So here are five things that you can pay, pay, pay attention to, which yes. might lose that, you know, your identity for whatever reason is limiting you. So for example, you react disproportionately to a situation, which means that some part of your identity gets triggered. It may be a national identity. It may be a religious identity. And very often when you get triggered, what will take place, go to the next point, please is that you judge quickly or criticize forcefully. And so if you are aware of the fact that something has happened, you've been triggered and that leads you to a judgment or a forceful criticism, then there is every likelihood that some part of your identity has been triggered. Next. Now, because this identity is deeply felt, it's part of our upbringing, much of it is unconscious. The way it manifests is not at the level of the identity. It manifests at the level of emotion. So many of us who might be experiencing recurring stress or strong negative emotions like fear and anxiety, shame, yeah. guilt, if you actually track it back very often, you can track it back to your values and you can track it back to your identity. What are you holding very strongly? Similarly, if you find yourself resisting new perspectives or learnings, because in a way the construct of your identity is so well fit, everything fits into place and you've rationalized it so that everything feels comfortable. When you have to make a new learning, maybe one little part of your identity has to be dropped in order to make space for that new learning. And so if you find yourself becoming resistant to new learning, 
then maybe your identity is limiting you. Next. And very often, if you feel stuck and your strengths are no longer working for you, then that may also be a clue that some part of your identity is outdated and needs to be refreshed or needs to be updated in order for you to cope with the new circumstances. Now, just for a moment, look at what's happening to us in COVID, right? Uh, it may well be that, you know, our sense of self, which was pre-COVID, has been fundamentally rattled by what has happened to us, what has happened to the planet, what has happened to us in terms of our work, in terms of our relations, etc. And until we are going to be able to deconstruct a part of that identity and reconstruct a part of our identity, we are going to really struggle with the COVID pandemic psychologically, not just physically or not just uh, financially, but even psychologically. So I just wanted to make this point that it is actually quite obvious when our identity is limiting us. Back to you, Nilima. You're on mute. I want to quickly add that this is very real for me. So just being vulnerable here. Um, I'm a naval officer's daughter. So when, when I find the uh, India-Pakistan uh, thing heating up, I find it actually hard to look at a Pakistani general's face or even hear what he's going to say if I'm browsing YouTube or something. I can feel a visceral sense of us and them rise up. I mean, I don't see a human being. I can just feel my identity rising up to, to block me. Uh, another time I have felt this is as a kid, we lived in Germany. Um, I was just eight and nine years old, and uh, there were a few uh, Indians with brown skin in this little town in uh, Germany. And everywhere I'd go, I could feel my skin burn on me because just feel people had never seen me, a, a person like me. So there was like, today it's called racial profiling in a negative way. But my, my point is that it's almost biologically, viscerally hardwired into us to be able to notice someone who is different from us. And so not blaming them for looking at me uh, so differently, but I felt like an other, right? So um, the, just this knowledge of this is not something I have to work out and off and release the trauma off <laughs> in order to show up in a, uh, in a way that identity doesn't limit me. So moving on. Um, Here's this whole thing about binaries, right? Understanding your opposite. Nothing is true without its exact opposite also being true. Thus, the universe seeks equilibrium. And this is Carl Jung. Okay? So the question we ask ourselves is, what is the purpose of polarity? Why does everything come in pairs? So guess what? Nature has an intelligent design to this. Think about a horseshoe magnet. It has a North Pole and a South Pole. Now, if I didn't, if this magnet were not created, there would not a, be a magnetic field between those two poles. And therefore, now, because it is magnetized space, when you put a wire through it, guess what? You unlock the potential energy of a system and you develop power or current that is needed to fuel a system, right? So if you basically understand that there is a purpose to polarity, we need diversity, we need two of everything because between those two, uh, creative energy and potential gets unlocked. And then also the diversity gives us ways to innovate and think differently. So this is the purpose of polarity, to create diversity and to unlock even more creative energy for use in the system. So over to you, Vijay, you know, unpacking identity some more. Unmute. So one of the important and common questions is that if identity is so hardwired in us, can we evolve? Can the identity evolve? And the answer to that question is very simply yes. So for example, Next, our identity can evolve with our life stage. 
when we are young, when we become adolescents, when we become adults, etc. Our identity can evolve next when we face a trauma. Now, for example, uh, in my own case, uh, my identity went through a fundamental shift after my cancer diagnosis 20 years ago. And in fact, even today in the work that we do with cancer, the healing from an illness like cancer comes when you deconstruct your identity and reconstruct it from scratch. So you, it not only evolves, you can make it evolve. You can actually shift it if you know how to do it. Next. As we know, identity shifts when it comes to context. Let us say if somebody has migrated from, let's say a very traditional country to a very modern country, then they are going to have to make their identity evolve so that they can actually find that sweet spot of maintaining their authenticity and conforming to a new cultural norm or a cultural convention. There is a lovely photograph of uh, And the last is that you can actually make a conscious choice to evolve your identity. This in a way is the purpose of all personal growth, transformation and spiritual practice that, you know, we want to consciously evolve our identity into a healthier and healthier place. So next slide, please. So what I want to talk about here is uh, a very important concept with regard to identity and with regard to growth. Uh, this is work from many different teachers, which we have synthesized and brought down to a single slide. And what this is really saying is that if you look at the history of humanity and if you look at what happens inside each individual, there are basically five levels of consciousness. So the very first level is called the I level. Okay, but this is an egocentric and an exclusive I. This is not the inclusive I that we are talking about. This is the exclusive I. This is an I that is only thinking about myself. It's quite narcissistic in nature. It's very self serving, it's survival oriented. The next level of identity, the next level of consciousness is called the us versus them consciousness. This is an ethnocentric consciousness. This has got to do with which tribe, which community, which caste, which country, etc. And usually this level of consciousness is identified by a lot of orthodoxy. There is a lot of territorialism. There are lots of rituals that are now as I'm developing this, I want you to keep thinking about examples of where you might find this. For example, the military traditionally is an us versus them hierarchical structure. And it's very important and it's very necessary for a country's sovereignty that the military takes this particular stance. So it's not as if any one of these levels is by itself positive or negative. It can become positive or negative. For example, today's polarization that we are seeing right now is very much an us versus them kind of a polarization, right versus left, conservative versus liberal, black versus white, north versus south. These are all us versus them levels of consciousness. Next. The third level of consciousness is when this is the age of scientific reason, right? This is when we leave behind our tribal differences and we start to look at natural and scientific laws that apply universally to everybody. The law of gravity applies everywhere on the planet in exactly the same way. If you cut a person, that person is going to bleed. And so there are certain principles and laws which start to equalize this us versus them. This is called the scientific level of consciousness. Next. The next one is called the we or the pluralistic level of consciousness. This is a multicultural inclusive and it has dimensions of a planetary consciousness. Let me give you an example here. Right now, if you see the environmental movement, the environmental movement is one of those movements that is pulling humanity towards a we and a planetary consciousness. Until now, we were happy with an it consciousness, a technology based consciousness, but we ignored the planet, but no more. And we are now having, we are being forced to look at it at a multicultural, inclusive and a planetary level. And finally, there is the 
one level of consciousness or the united level of consciousness, which is integral, which is universal, which is boundaryless. This is the level of consciousness that all spiritual traditions have always been pointing us to, to say that, you know, uh, aspire towards the one rather than aspiring towards the I, which is the egocentric one and the one which is the united one. So if you look at it at the bottom, there is what we call the exclusive I, which is a very tight and contracted and narrow kind of an awareness. And if you look at the other side, there is what we describe as the inclusive I, which is a very expanded kind of awareness. So I'm presenting this to you so that you can look at your own list of 35 items. You can look at your own concentric circles and you can start to identify which of these, which of those words that you selected that describe you at what level of consciousness are those words really coming from. And remember that there are no rights and wrongs. Uh, there is a healthy part of the I, there is an unhealthy part of the I, there is a healthy part of the us versus them. There is an unhealthy part of the us versus them. There is a healthy part of the it, there is an unhealthy part of the it. But hopefully this will give you an idea of looking at your own selection and trying to understand where is your center of gravity when it comes to your identity. Back to you, Nilima. Thank you, Vijay. <clears throat> so since you've taken us to the integral unitive eye, um, it's so beautiful, this concept of the all-seeing eye, uh, as in E-Y-E, and I as an I, right? So this exists as the third I in the Indic yogic tradition. They talk about the third I of Shiva, right? Which is that third sweet spot from which all binaries, all dualities, all polarities get reconciled, get harmonized, and everything returns to being seen in its fullness. It also exists in the Buddhic tradition called the all seeing eyes of the Buddha. Uh, it's in the Egyptian tradition called the Eye of Horus. So these are normally called the all-seeing eyes, E-Y-E. <laughs> I wanted to make the point to the eye because the inclusive eye is about the ability to see with new eyes, with fresh eyes, with wide eyes, with all-seeing eyes, right? And therefore you were using this I see you in your breakouts. This is a capacity we have to build, the ability to see as widely as possible the reality of things. What are the implications of organizational culture about this inclusive eye, which is a capacity we can all develop, right? Uh, it helps with diversity, where we can bridge differences of people and individuals, um, identities for more innovative outcomes. Uh, it helps with equity. We can watch for normalized bias and power dynamics. And it helps with inclusion because we create belonging, the inclusive eye. If we build that capacity in ourselves, we have the capacity to engage better. We become uh, more well um, and there's more loyalty with the organization. So the inclusive eye is a concept we are in a way announcing and launching on this uh, program today saying, hey, here is a self within each of us potential that can be skilled and developed. And it has all these amazing um, uh, uses and benefits. But you think, right, that everything that irritates us about others can lead us to an understanding of ourselves. Right? Because it is the, and it's something you have disowned in yourself. So if you can find out what that is, you can become a little more whole and understand yourself better, hold yourself more passionately as well as the other. And this is a lovely slide. Different opinion phobia. The word means fear of others having opinions that differ from your own. And the only known treatment is to get over yourself. You are not the center of the earth. It's about taking ourselves lightly. So let's do an inclusion this. <clears throat> I'm going to stop sharing screen and I'm going to get into gallery view. So I hope you can all see each other. And 
this is a very sweet and simple practice. If you see someone on the screen who was in your breakout room, I'm going to give you four affirmation statements. You're going to stay on mute. I'm going to call them out and you're going to follow me as I say it. And you're going to see every single face and presence on the screen. And you're going to first say, all is one, there is no other. Okay, because that's the quantum soup actually. And then you're going to say, I am just another you. I am here to be me. So go ahead. Vijay has also put it in the chat box. Look at each other. Open your hearts, relax your mind, relax your gut. See this incredible spread of humanity from around the world. And know this to be true, as you say, all is one. There is no other. I am just another you. And I am here to be me. All is one, there is no other. I am just another you. I am here to be me. All is one, there is no other. I am just another you. I am here to be me. Take a deep breath and just notice what's going on in your body, your breath, your mind. Has your cells heard you say this? I don't know about you, but my whole being is just filling with energy. There's a warmth moving through my whole body right now. As if we are getting connected in that morphogenetic field of, of the oneness that is the ground of all things. Okay. So just remember the wonderful words, right? All is one, there is no other. I'm just another you. I am here to be me. So, in closing, thank you for having been here with us up to this point. We had asked for the few minutes here. I love this poem from Madhika Saran. She says, peel off all the layers that hide you. You are not a spouse, a sibling, a parent, or a child. Just a role you play at a given point in time. You are not your designation, your title, your degree, or award. That is only what you do or what you have done. You are not your successes or your failures. That is only an outcome of your efforts and factors you couldn't control. You are not your house, car, perfume, or the brands that you use. That's just the money you spent. You are not the people you know or the places you have been to. That's just the choices you made. You are not the books you read, the music you hear, or the shows you watch. That's just the flavor of the moment. Peel off these layers and see what's left. Have you met yourself yet? And here I believe she's referring to that unitive oneness that you are, the inclusive I. Vijay, you want to go with this one? Unmute. Yeah. Yeah, so this is, a, this is a lovely little Zen saying that, uh, you know, a disciple goes to the master and says, 
why am i unhappy and the master says why are you unhappy because 95% of because what you like and 98% of what you think is about yourself next and there isn't one and so this is a zen way of saying exactly what madhulika's quote says that we sometimes mistake all those roles all those activities all those designations as our identity and when you strip away everything you actually find that there isn't the notion of self it's an artificial construct that we have created and that returns us to the ground of being where the small self can merge with the bigger self there is a uh, there is a somebody has said monica has said can you please put up madhulika's quote again so we can do that in a moment you can take a screenshot of it or something monica yeah so the inclusive i in summary identity defines you but need it dominate or diminish you if you hold your identity lightly you can include the other without losing yourself moving from the exclusive i towards the inclusive i takes practice but beyond your identity is the great prize of oneness so it's worth going for so i don't know if you have time for some quick questions vijay or do you want to just go to the poll then maybe that's how we will get what people i think i think let's give have to give people a couple of minutes to uh ask the questions or reflect on the questions those of you who want to uh, but those of you who have to sign off at 8 o'clock we respect that and what i'm going to do is i'm just going to put up the poll so that we can get a quick feedback from you and then we are happy to stay on for another 15 minutes and answer whatever questions there are so may i request you i'm going to put up the poll now there are uh, two questions that we'd like you to answer and a third question which i will come to so let's begin you should be able to see the two questions of the poll on your screen and all you have to do is to answer the these two questions so so far we have 14 of 17 who have voted a few more people 15 thank you a couple more people still to vote we would love to hear your comments please if you haven't voted okay so let me then close the polling and share the results with you that is what you have said so thank you for that great feedback uh, it looks like a lot of people would like to have a follow up session we'll be in touch with you with regard to that the last question i want to ask everyone who is still on the call and if you can please put this point in the chat box is what was the one thing that was most valuable for you today from the session that we had 90 minutes we spent together what was the most valuable thing from the session today
Yes, time just flew. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Suva. Jayanti, Pramila, Anand, Nina, thank you. You're most welcome. It was a pleasure. Concept. Thank you, Neeraj. Stephanie, glad you enjoyed the breakouts. Thank you, Rajesh. Thank you, Jovina. Yes, it will be lovely if we can have some more time. <laughs> Okay, so uh, probably everyone has uh, put in your comments. Thank you very much. Uh, we are happy to stay on for a while. If any one of you has questions, we'd be happy to answer the questions. But we had said that the session would last from 6.30 to 8. So if any one of you has other commitments and want to jump off, you're welcome to do so. Thank you very much for joining us. Those of you who want to stay on, please do. We'll be happy to take any questions. I have no questions, but um, Nilima did ask me where I had come from, <laughs> how I ended up joining here. Frankly, I don't know how I ended up coming here, but I must tell you, I had a good time. And I think I'm getting to know myself. It was, it was a very good um, introspection. Thank you, Pramila. It was, it was good. Thank you. Anyone else has any questions to ask or any comments to make? We are here for you. Thank you, Stephanie. And the emails, I have a question. Yes. Uh, yes, Nilima and Vijay. Uh, the emails that we have, it is because of some conditioning that we develop while we are growing up, uh, picking it from the environment, from our education, all this. Now they get embedded into our system and we are all the time uh, relating, operating from that reference point. Yes. Now in the process, we also discover that it is uh, very, very limiting uh, experience that we are gathering from that. Yet also we see that it is very important because when you are functioning in a materialistic world, in a material world, you have to function from the platform of binaries. Because when you are making a choice, you have to take a stand. So this intrinsic dilemma which is there all the time embedded in the system demands us to be intelligent and this intelligence you cannot or wisdom that you cannot get from any book from your experience it need to happen at that moment of time is there a means where these things can happen to us at the right time, right moment, with the right people. Thank you, Alok. I, I'll take that question. Yeah. Um, I didn't have time to mention that there are so many wonderful tools and techniques to actually practice the ability to be more inclusive with your identity. So have you heard of the Buddhist practice of metta? which is sharing loving kindness. 
So just, I mean, I don't know if you do yoga or any other practice, but I am a regular yoga practitioner. In, in the Buddhist tradition, there are regular metta practitioners. So they begin by doing this meditation of opening their heart with loving kindness towards themselves, towards their loved ones, and then towards even their so-called enemies and challengers. So that is one practice called metta. And the more, it's, it's a skill you can develop. You can expand your consciousness, but it takes practice. The more you practice it, when the moment comes and you need it, it is there because you have put in the time to press it, right? So um, there is a Hawaiian technique called Ho'oponopono, which says, you know, uh, please forgive me. I'm sorry. I love you. I thank you. That is another kind of meditation. These are ways in which you can start peeling off all these binaries that have got stuck to you and hold your identity lightly instead of tightly. And that's all you need to do. You need to have your unique boundaries, but we say have semi-permeable boundaries, have the ability to let the other in, right, in the right amount. So there are, there are practices to do this. This is why people choose mindfulness and meditation and all these uh, personal growth practices. Just to continue with that, you know, a little bit. Uh, as long as we are operating from the level of our intellect, uh, the divide is going to be there because the very fact that this is the instrument which operates in division. So, in a way, uh, this oneness will be able to dawn to us when we go beyond intellect. Now, yes. in Vedanta, we have this approach of neti neti. That is what uh, I have been uh, practicing and now. So, uh, but when it comes to psychological level, one is able to take it. But when it is coming to physical level, it is not happening. So you cannot be non-violent. Yeah. yeah. One cannot be yeah, non-violent. One of the practices we then teach in the integral approach is you don't only work with your mind and say, I'm not this, I'm not that. You don't only work with your heart and say, I love you one. You don't only work with your body and say, I'm going to work out with my yoga asana, right? You work with all the instruments you have and that is all an integral practice. Then it becomes easier. So Vijay, I want to quickly talk about how we do presence. Yeah, I think uh, the important thing here is, as Nilima says, is to look at the foundational and basic practices rather than practices that are in specific silos, something which is a mental practice, something which is a physical practice, etc. So what is it that can be done? What is that internal state that we can cultivate, which is a foundational centering, grounding, anchoring kind of a state? What in uh, the Indian tradition might be called the, the dhyana, Right or what in some other tradition might be called presence or what in some other tradition might be called mindfulness or whatever it is, right? So I think the important thing here is to, as you correctly said, is not to go beyond the intellect, but perhaps beneath the intellect, which is the ground from which even intellect arises, the ground from which physicality arises, the ground from which emotion arises, the ground from which relational issues arise. And so I guess our approach would be to actually go down to that ground and try and be in touch with that ground as much as possible. We call it presence. Thanks, Alok. Anyone else has a Thank question? Thank you so much. Um, it, it seemed very easy when you were talking about it. Um, what, I, what I feel is when we are yeah. reacting or whenever we are, whenever we behave in a particular manner, whatever the case may be, 
I'm not going to think I'm using my cognitive side of the brain and I'm using my heart to th do the thinking. So the so-called presence that you talked about, to get there, I'll probably, I'll, I'll probably move on and not get there. Well, you might surprise yourself, Pramila. <laughs> I'm 68 now. <laughs> to, to reach there, I don't know. So, so, yeah, so Pramila, uh, the, the good news is it's possible. Yeah. There are practices. Yeah. So it's like saying, um, so I, I used to do yoga for many years and then I stopped for a long time in the middle. I recently picked it up again. And I thought, oh my God, I'm 54. This B is now not going to be able to get into all that. But as they say, practice, practice, practice. There is no substitute for practice. And lo and behold, in COVID, the, the, you know, taking up yoga again, this body has learned to go back into asana as it used to do 20 years ago, right? So the beautiful thing, neuroscience will tell you this, um, all kinds of uh, biology also tells you this, that our brain has plasticity, our body has plasticity, and we have tremendous potential and capacity to grow, provided we practice and put in the time and effort. I know, so I know what you're possible. saying. I know what you're saying. I can feel it because about 15 years ago, I gave up. I, I used to learn classical music. I gave up 15 years ago. And um, thanks to COVID, I said, let me pick it up. I couldn't, I couldn't get my voice back. And just yesterday, I said, good heavens, now I'm getting it back. I can feel it. I can feel it. I was so happy. Oh, no, but no classical for me. That's a different issue. <laughs> so that is the same thing. The same thing applies to, to presence practice. Anything takes practice and you get good at it. Anything. All right. I'll need 36 hours in a day. No, we'll get there. Thank you so much. I'll take leave. I've enjoyed the session thoroughly. Thank you. Thank you, Pamela. So if there are any other questions, we'll be happy to take them. Otherwise, time to say goodbye or good say evening goodbye. or good morning, whoever is in whichever part of the world. Uh, any last questions? Thank you so much for joining. Uh, thank you so much for participating. Uh, we'll be in touch with you if you want to do a follow-up session since many of you said you're interested in it. Let's see what we can come up with. Thanks everyone. Goodbye. All right. Bye now. Padel, I'm so happy to see you on the call. Thank you very much. Bye. Suva. Bye, Suva. Thank Bye, you. Bye, Alok. Bye, Anna. Padel, are you there? I decided to see you.